Well, hi, this is Patrick Carey and with Darius uh, Jones, and I'd like to, uh, get to introduce him. He was uh, one of the panelists that couldn't make it for the la for the um, the previous session. Uh, he was part of the ori the original panel, so we're doing some uh, uh, some interviewing now f uh, with with him to add some unique content that he he can provide. Um, so let me see. I guess the best thing to do would be to, to introduce him. I've already introduced myself, you know, so you need you don't need that replicated. So Darius. You're on, man. So I, I basically give a little bit of uh, a little bit of um, background, describe what you're doing, and um, why you're on this panel. Why I'm talking to you. Okay, yeah. My name's uh, Darius Jones. I've been with the Chicago Botanic Garden for the last five years. Uh, my first introduction uh, into uh, sustainable urban horticulture uh, was in 2010, in 2010 as a uh, inmate in a uh, Cook County Vocational Rehabilitation Impact Center. Uh, after that, I moved on into a transitional job program with the Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, and then from there, I joined the NAMIC program, uh, interning as a farmer's market manager, then moving into a direct sales assistant position, uh, and then moving up into sales coordinator, and now as the McCormick Rooftop Farm Manager uh, at the McCormick Place Convention Center in Chicago, Illinois. Great. That that's I think is that the biggest uh, agricultural green roof in uh, the Midwest, right? Where yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, half an acre vegetable production rooftop garden, uh, biggest in the Midwest. Man, that's great. What kind of vegetables do you, do you grow? Uh, last year we had seventeen crops, fifty-one varieties. This year, um, it, uh, since last year was a lot of trial and error, we slimmed it down to uh, seven crops and fifteen varieties. So we have uh, kale, Swiss chard. Um, uh, we do basil, we have uh, tomatoes, eggplant, um, peppers, and then a host of herbs and edible flowers, uh, as well as we have bee halves, three bee halves, two vermicompost systems, uh, and then do indoor micro, uh, micro green production and uh, plant propagation as well. Great. Yeah, Darius was giving me a little, um, uh, well... <laughs> I was like, you, Darius, we're giving, we're giving me a tour, <laughs> a tour today up there. And uh, you, I, I saw the worm bins and the, the indoor stuff you're doing, uh, both in terms of preparing plants to go outside, but also uh, you have some um, a hydroponic system that's completely inside. Could you describe that, uh, that yeah. system? Yeah, so we're building out a 1,500-gallon aquaponic system, which is fairly small. Uh, it's really an introduction to the space. Uh, before we go to a large scale system that would be mostly for production. Mm -hmm. uh, this system, uh, it, it's, it would be 90 square feet of growing space. Uh, so two float racks. Um, uh, it would be a three tier system. Uh, the top being a shell based media with some red wigglers that would be able to um, that would be 12 inches deep that would allow like tomatoes and peppers to grow. Um, and, and then the the plants, so aquaponics, you know, is using uh, fish waste to fertilize plants and then taking those plants' nutrients um, to support the fish. So we will have tilapia, um, and since all of the produce from the McCormick Place is grown on the roof, it goes back into uh, the kitchen for Savor Chicago. So they would actually take the fish as well. Oh, cool. Well, uh, so that's, that leads right into the next question. Where does your produce go? Yeah, so all of our produce at the McCormick Place rooftop garden goes directly into uh, Savor Chicago's kitchen, which is uh, who we have our contract with at this uh, specific location. So 100%, they use it all. They use it all. Um, and this year we're starting to do, we're going to be doing more uh, value-added products, so like basil, pestos, and um, different type of vinaigrettes and oils with the herbs. Um, and oh, then cool. salsas with the tomatoes um, and pe peppers. So uh, just trying to make it, uh, trying to make the utilization piece more of a focus this year uh, than anything. So you're actually process. You'll actually plan on processing some of the stuff that you harvest. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Correct. Oh, great. Okay. Um, one of the things we talked about in the in the other panel was the difference between seasonal work on the outs. You know, see when you have a a farm situation you're outside how that mm -hmm. affects the workflow in terms of people that are working there and all of a sudden the the fall hits the winter hits and people are out of work and they got to transition and uh one of the panelists uh, george Irwin, does a lot of indoor work 
And it seems like this is a good opportunity that when you're doing the processing, like the, the pestos and the vinaigrettes and stuff, that's, that's a good uh, turnover for indoor work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, processing, the processing will be a, a good turnover. I don't know if we'll do that hands-on per se, but mm -hmm. a lot of the work that we do in the winter is like hoop house maintenance and build out. So there's still work in that area. Uh -huh. Um, we do a lot of season extension uh, at our other different sites. So Windy City Harvest has uh, about 11 sites in the city mm -hmm. uh, that that focuses on um, uh, sustainable urban agriculture that we use for our uh, apprenticeship program as well as our transitional jobs program. So <clears throat> with our transitional jobs program, they get to, you know, they get everything, you know, they get to turn a compost oh, down yeah, yeah, yeah. in the winter. <laughs> As long as it's, you know, as long as it's not below freezing temperatures, we're mm -hmm. out there and we're, you know, we're getting after it. So, yeah, there's always work to do, regardless of whether it's spring, summer, fall, or the winter time. Oh, that's cool. Well, if you don't mind, could you talk a little bit about uh, your life before the program? Yeah, so yeah. I grew up in Chicago in the uh, West Garfield Park neighborhood. Um, I, I grew up in a household with just me and my mother, so... Once I became a, a, around the age between 10 and 13 years old, uh, I was looking, I was, you know, I had that void, you know, of missing mm -hmm. the father. My father was in my life periodically, uh, but uh, once I was 10 and 13, I kind of uh, gravitated towards my environment uh, and looked to those, to those individuals as like big brothers or, you know, like that, mm -hmm. uh, that figurehead in my life. So... I started going downhill, got into a lot of trouble. Um, before the age of 13, I mean, I was in different programs, like boys and girls programs, and uh, I played golf, like I told you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. That shook me up when you told me that. Play <laughs> golf. Uh, yeah, but, and then, but once I turned 13 and once I got into seventh grade, onward between seventh grade uh, and my junior year in high school, um, I went downhill, began to uh, uh, join, I joined the gang um, and began that lifestyle. Uh, and then once I was uh, leading up to my incarceration at 17, my junior year in high school, um, I lost a close friend to me. So, uh, and it was too gun violent. So I became really like uh, involved in that lifestyle and that type of living. So um, once I got in, I was incarcerated for 20 months. Um, before I was able to get my sentence of, of five months. So um, that was huge. That was huge as well before I joined the program because while incarcerated, um, it kind of reinforced that gang lifestyle yeah. and mentality being incarcerated. You know, right. it wasn't rehabilitating at all. Um, so once I actually got my sentence uh, to the Vocational Rehabilitation Impact Center, after my sentence, after my classification was dropped down, uh, I joined the garden program and that was kind of, you know, something to do. I was in maximum security the whole time I was incarcerated. Um, so it went, it was about two years before I, and I went outside one time. Oh so, man. Yeah. So once yeah. I started gardening, you know, it was just like, forget these plants, forget <laughs> you couldn't these get them off the roof. Yeah. I just wanted to be outside, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can hear that. I really, no, I know too that what happens that a lot of people when they get in the system, you yeah. know, it makes it real easy to stay in the system. You know, that's, yeah, that's man. one thing that happens all the time. Um, it's community. It, it creates community. Yeah. You know, this is your support system. This is your network of people that you have in your life. Are these, you know, these other uh, felons or yeah, yeah, know, yeah, guys incarcerated? Well, the irony is it winds up, uh, you know, prison sentences wind up not being that much of a deterrent after you've been in the system for a while. It's not that much of a, you know, a letdown to do some time after a while. It turns yeah. into a really destructive cycle. Um, yeah, it's true. Could you tell me something, um, when you started off on the program, um, could you talk about some of the things that were, um, say, hard adjustments, things that were difficult for you to adjust to on the one hand, but other also um, some things that were easy for you to, you to adjust to? Uh, yeah, both so, pros and cons coming in. Yeah, so uh, when I first started off in the program, a lot of the, the pros were that 
I was outside, you know, I can do the work. The work was nothing, you know, I was getting paid to do the work. So mm-hmm. uh, I liked working with my hands anyway. So uh, moving compost or planting some hair lettuce, you know, that was that was the joy of it. You know, that was the good time. Uh, and then once I once I got into the NAMON class, I had already been in the transitional program. So once I joined the apprenticeship class, I had already had some of the skills like harvesting and transplanting and, you know, the knowledge of uh, of soil and compost versus compost, you know. Um, but a lot of the cons for me at the, at the beginning of the program was like integrating into uh, this community of people that were from different different dem- demographics across the country. So, mm-hmm. like, you know, at that point, I had never been exposed to people from, you know, California or, you know, uh, different different ethnic backgrounds. Mm-hmm. I was never exposed to that at that point. And so once I was... Even, you know, had to, even growing up in Chicago. Yeah, even growing up in Chicago, oh, you know, with the automatic system. And it's, you know, it's still kind of like segregation. You yeah, know, you yeah, have yeah. your tight-knit community. So... Right. Um, and so that was the hardest part of the program was, you know, feeling accepted, even if, you know, somebody sparked up a conversation with me, I would kind of, you know, uh, veer off from it and, you know, uh, kind of put my head towards somewhere else because I wasn't, you know, aware of that or, uh, uh, had been in contact with, you know, people who were willing to talk to me of a different race or of a different color, you know, just because of how I carry myself at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the hardest part at the initially. I think it would be hard even under, I mean, people would be saying words you'd understand, but the underlying meaning comes out of the culture you understand, you know. And so like if you're, if you're not familiar with what their culture, they might as well be speaking Chinese, you know. Yeah, no, I understand yeah, exactly. that. Um, let me see. Okay, uh, I got a couple of. What do you think you'd be doing? I, I, this is sort of hy- hypothetical, but what do you think you'd be doing had you not gone into that program at all? Yeah. So uh, I feel it's if I. So I kind of told you this earlier in the day, but um, once I after once I joined the program, you know, nothing changed for me at that point. You know, it was just another thing to do during my day. But afterwards, you know, I was still going back to the same community and the same lifestyle. So uh, while in the program, nothing, I was still the same person, you know, I was still Mm -hmm. doing the same things that I had already been doing. And so um, with the program, it kind of, it kind of made me, it kind of forced me uh, to make adjustments. Uh, Because once Mm -hmm. I started working as the direct sales assistant, uh, uh, I had to force myself to speak to people, you know, I had to force myself mm-hmm. uh, to, to cross those boundaries, you know, open up to that paradigm shift. So if I hadn't, you know, been forced to do those things, I probably would have wound it up, uh, I would have wound it up back in jail or either dead because it was all about, you know, it wasn't really about selling drugs for me. It was about, yeah. you know, my peers and how they looked at me. So I probably would have... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I would have been you know, back into that gang community or either dead or in jail, you know, for the rest of my life. Well, the disadvantage, I mean, the, the, the benefit of gangs is that it, it does allow you a certain protection within where you're living. You know, there's it a lot of camaraderie and all that crap. And if you don't have that, if you don't have alternatives for that, then, you know, that's that's what you go for, because it's that's a basic human need, you know. So, no, I understand yeah. that completely. What do you what do you see cropping up in the future for you? I mean, if, if you were like to. Get, look at a crystal ball and see what's going to happen in the next three, five, six, ten years? Yeah. Well, uh, in 2013, and I was telling you this earlier, in 2013, I started uh, uh, this business called Urban Aggies, uh, which is a sustainable urban agriculture business. Um, and I was selling uh, vegetables directly to this wholesale company called Midwest Foods. Um, and then in 2014, Uh, I expanded the operation to a quarter acre with the uh, Beginning the Farmers Ranchers development grant that uh, the Chicago Botanic Garden received. Um, So, I mean, I see my future as an entrepreneur. You know, I I have my background in sales. Um, I've developed skills with speaking to people and public speaking and, you know, just being confident in uh, my knowledge. So, 
I see uh, I see myself in five years continuing in the food industry. Uh, it may not be at this part of the spectrum, but in, it could be in distribution. It could be uh, in the wholesale business. It could be, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in restaurant business. Um, there's no telling. I, I really love the food industry. I love the sense of community. I love the, it's almost like uh, a lot of these, these foodie type peoples are rebels. For a college, you know? <laughs> and so I respect that. You know, I respect that. My whole childhood, growing up, I felt like a rebel for a cause. You mm-hmm. know? Uh, so, yeah, I see myself, you know, as an entrepreneur investing in the food industry, um, and I see myself doing that for a while, maybe twenty, thirty years down the line. Sure. Do you see the? I mean, the Windy City Harvest Program has how many sites? I got about five or six sites. Uh, 11 sites. 11 yeah. sites. So that I, I got, to, I have some t- statistics on their on their productivity someplace in a pile of papers here, uh, <laughs> but uh, I see that they, I mean, they contribute uh, uh, food to WIC programs and not contribute, they sell it to them. But I mean, food goes to shelters <laughs> to WIC programs. I was talking to a guy in um, uh, New York that does the um, the Brooklyn Grange. He says that some of the food goes to farmers markets over there. They've got. I mean, part of the trick of making urban agriculture work is uh, breaking up the distribution. So some goes, some food goes here, some food goes there. Do you see um, through your experience with Windy City Harvest um, how it's affected low income communities in terms of uh, them getting them getting food, but from close by. Yeah, uh, you know, the WIC program in particular, and this is something that uh, as an entrepreneur I've paid attention to, but, you know, these, uh, uh, those participants in this program receive uh, $15 worth of, you know, fresh produce. Um, and when we drop it off, you know, they, they really appreciate it. They appreciate, you know, getting the produce. So um, it's almost like creating a new... It's, it's almost like creating a new customer segment, mm-hmm. uh, the WIC program, you know, because uh, it's, it's really good. You know, you get a you get a zucchini from the grocery store and a zucchini from, you know, a locally produced, sustainably grown source. They taste completely different. Um, and a lot of these and a lot of these customers uh, are starting to, you know, go out to the farmer's market more and venture out and, you know, participate in, uh, uh, with co-ops and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's really creating a, a new, a new customer segment, uh, for these lower income communities. Um, and especially with the dollar value coupons that they are starting to do, mm-hmm. uh, in Chicago, um, where they, you know, buy a dollar worth of produce, they get a dollar back, you know, that really promotes that, you know, that come back the next time and uh, and yeah I mean yeah a lot of a lot of those things too they keep the money in the community because if they're if they're you know they're not buying zucchinis or whatever from like 300 500 miles away it's got, got not getting ship, shipped in it's fresher mm-hmm. and they actually know the people that are growing their food which is really critical especially mm-hmm. you know, I, I've seen a, a bunch of urban agriculture programs too where they go through like uh, uh, cooking clinics and stuff like this, showing people how to uh, you expand the recipes they're, they're cooking with. Because I know a lot of times, if you don't have time, you go to White Castle. If you don't have yeah. time, you go to McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, it's true. So uh, yeah, well, cool. Well, um, I'm out of questions. I think we covered this. Uh, <clears throat> I think we're stick a fork in it. I think we're done. So, uh, do you have any? Um, let me see. Let me ask you this. Um, What was your what's your overall take on um, coming out of okay coming out of prison? You go into a program. Um, have you ever felt like you're be, that you were like manipulated by the people in the program? You know, like looked down uh, on, or they're trying <laughs> to shape you in different kinds of ways and all that stuff. That was yeah, kind of heavy handed. Good question. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there was a sense of, you know, a dog and pony show, you know, going on sometimes as, I mean, because like I told you, uh, a lot of our funding is not, you know, uh, a lot of our funding is not government. It's not a lot of government funding. It's a lot of private donors and private Mm -hmm. family foundations. So, uh, you know, they come on a tour, you know, you have to give a tour to these people, you know, um, so they can see that their money is going to a good cause. Right. Um, 
so I mean initially I was drawn back from that you know I kind of felt like I was being used in a sense uh, but then once I once I I kind of took it and you know ran with it like okay so I, I'm uncomfortable with this this is the part of of my job that I'm uncomfortable with so you know and then I mean within the with within the program there was a lot of like mentors for me that I had mm -hmm. so and uh, the manager Kelly Larson she told me you know like you know when you're uncomfortable most of the time you're doing something right if you're uncomfortable in that situation right. it's because you know it's something new you know you should open yourself up to that so once I started opening myself up to that you know uh, it wasn't as I didn't feel so attacked you know as I did before um, and like I mean, one of the benefits of the program is that they hire guys on that does that do well. Mm -hmm. It's like I was a transitional guy and I was hired on. So the next wave of transitional guys, you know, they work under me. Now I'm their supervisor and I could <laughs> pass on these skills. I could just see yeah, your thing. next thing you're gonna be on the lecture tour, man. I guess I could <laughs> just, no, I'm sorry, I got this lecture I gotta give in uh, San Francisco in two weeks. I gotta hop hop a plane. I'm sorry, see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that happen though. You know, guys go, guys yeah. get into some uh, uh, you know kind of popular field, and all of a sudden they start getting divorced from that field. I mean, I think it's cool yeah. you're kind of uncomfortable with doing that in the first place. You know, yeah. because uh, I know that people get can get too comfortable with being uh, you know getting their picture taken, getting a, yeah. talking to a, you know, a bunch of people that are saying, "Hey, you're doing a great job," and all of a sudden they start losing a sense of reality. You know. So that's yeah. cool. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I'm done with this. I we could just shoot, <laughs> we could just shoot the shit or something. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I you know, I think we covered all all the bases we need to for for the for the balance of the panel. Um, one of the things that that was uh, that the other guys brought up in the other panel was uh, a challenge of bringing people in. Uh, George Irwin uh, has a business and he keeps. Um, he has a like a proprietary business, right? Uh, Green Living Technology, and they all he he trains people in those you know in his particular products, his particular methodology, and sort of keeps them in the family, so to speak. Every now and then, someone splits and creates a uh, com competing business, you know, and, and he doesn't like that, but that's sort of life, you know. Um, yeah. So he has a tendency to bring it. He he brings in people where he has a lot of control over how they're trained and what they know and all that stuff. And the same thing with um, Peter Ensign. Um, he said that he has he, he's complained to me sometimes. You get got these people that come in, but they don't have enough job skills to turn out the numbers they need to satisfy mm -hmm. the grants that, that support them and stuff. Um, so the volunteers that you supervise now, and the people that you supervise, do you see um, big differences between them when they come into the program and the way you came in when you came into the program? Now that you're in a, like a supervisory level now. Yeah. So uh, we uh, initially we had a relationship with uh, uh, Illinois. Or initially we had a relationship with Cook County. Um, which is how the boot camp or the vocational rehabilitation impact center mm -hmm. relationship started, um, but that that was ended um, two years ago. So and then now we're working with uh, Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, uh, which is youth, which is you know that starts off at sixteen. So it's a completely mm -hmm. different group of, uh, of individuals that we're pulling from. Um, this year we're we're trying to pour for more of a uh, adult. Uh, population, mm -hmm. um, but when we were pulling from that VRIC population after I was uh, after I was hired on, you know, it was it was completely different from for me. It was completely different seeing them come in than when I came in uh, because it you know it kind of uh, like multi it it kind of I kind of saw the flaws that I had. You know, I kind of. Yo, I was able to see, you right. know, where my wrongs were, where their wrongs were, and their wrongs, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but with this juvenile population, it's more, it's it's a lot worse than that because uh, 
they know their wrongs. You could point out their wrongs, and they, you know, they don't care. You know, they don't have to have a job. <laughs> yeah, right. No, <laughs> they don't I mean, have. To. Right. They don't need. They don't need the training. They don't. Well, they do need it, but to them, you know, they don't, they don't need yeah. a job. You know, they don't have a family to support. Um, well, do, do, you have, uh, but, do you have guys coming into the to the program just to just to get into a program? You know, just to say like, I don't care that much about farming, but this is better than my other options and I'll like tolerate yeah. it until, yeah. All the time, all the time. We get guys that, you know, come in for two weeks, get that first check and they're out, you know. Um, and especially with this juvenile population, they're, you know, they're the riskiest population because again, it's about grant compliances and, you know, our numbers. Right. So when we get these youth that, you know, they just come in, you think they're doing really good. They work hard. They do everything they need to do. And then they're just, they're, you know, never come back. And it's like, dang, that was, you know, $500 that we just spent, you know? Yeah, right. Um, and, and training, too. I mean, you, you, they were getting skills when they left, you know? So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm, so, um, so, yeah, I mean, I see uh, now, I mean, lately, like last year, one of my, my last interns from last year at the McCormick Place, um, at the apprenticeship program, he was a uh, former uh, transitional jobs uh, guy. Uh, Stacy Kimmins and uh, we hired him on this year mm -hmm. um, and like I mean initially when we first started working he was gonna leave the program because uh, you know he for him it, it was like I'm not getting paid enough you right. know this is yeah. not this is not a sustainable living wage mm -hmm. um, um, but he was more of a different case because he he was a he was willing to listen he was willing to take the information that was given to him um and be like okay and, you know he's kind of right you know mm -hmm. i'm not getting paid that much in terms of currency but in terms of the knowledge i'm gaining in terms of the relationships i'm building sure. um it's you know it's invaluable um so do you think that i mean you're, you're probably familiar with some other programs that are linked to uh you know king county and and i'm, I'm sort of curious that does the fact that they're doing something uh, green have any kind of influence or you know say, say for instance there was a job doing I don't know auto body repair or uh, yeah whatever construction would is the do you see the the fact that it's a, a green endeavor rubbing off on the the people that go through the program in any way uh you know, I saw it more so when I was the sales manager. Now I'm at McCormick Place, you know, the guys, I don't really see them, you know, uh, uh, I don't really see it rubbing off. But as the sales manager, you know, uh, I was able to speak in terms of numbers. You know, I was able to say, you know, this 20 bunches of kale is worth uh, $40, you know, mm -hmm. um, or this four pounds of kale is worth $16, you know, um, and show them, you know, how, how, uh, because for them, it was all about, you know, money. It was all about the currency. Sure. Um, sure. and so that aspect of showing them, you know, how, how things translate, you know, in terms of just because, just because this, this looks like a community garden, that doesn't mean you can, can't get a profit from it, you know, I got you. because I mean, in a lot of these lower income communities, there's community gardens everywhere, you know, whether it's being utilized or whether it's abandoned, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but these guys don't look at that as, you know, being something that that has value. Right. Uh, right. So once they once they come through the program, they see, you know, me packaging in and making the sales and shipping it out. Um, and then they see the checks and the amounts. And especially as a, a incubator farmer for Windy City Harvest. Um, once I had my plot of land, and uh, last year I made uh, thirty eight hundred, uh, thirteen thousand eight hundred dollars, you know, from a quarter acre. Mm -hmm. So these guys seeing that, they're like, "Whoa, wait a minute, you know, that's yeah, right, that's, right, that's extra income, you know, on top of my already <laughs> salary." So they're like, "Wait a minute, mm -hmm. what is that, you know?" So uh, yeah, thanks an awful lot, Darius, giving us a, a, a really unique perspective and a one that uh, you don't get very much when we're talking about uh, green activities and uh, you know how it can get turned around. Usually, the people you talk to are the people uh, you know that are organizing that are 
what, getting grants and running programs. And it's uh, essential that we get the experience and perspective of people coming through those programs. That, that's, that's really critical. And, uh, yeah, I wish you a lot of luck. And um, you're obviously uh, you're, you're on the verge of getting it done to the speaker tour there, Darius. I can see it in you, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so, and that's it. That's it for the panel. So bye-bye.